Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar about the Zero Day Initiative. My name is Dustin Childs. Before we begin, I wanted to cover just a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, I would love to hear them. You can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. I will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed, or if we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. We do capture all questions, so please feel free to ask even if we're at the very end. A copy of today's slide deck and additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder at the bottom of your screen. You can expand your slide area by clicking the maximize icon on the top right of the slide or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget as a question mark icon and cover some of the technical issues you may uh, encounter. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available in approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. As I said, my name is Dustin Childs and I uh, handle communications and outreach for the Zero Day Initiative. A quick moment about me. Uh, I came out of the Air Force in the late 90s. I was part of the team that was uh, chartered to capture hackers back in the late 90s which was the burgeoning days of the internet uh, and when we thought a port scan was a big deal. Uh, if you want to Google my greatest hits, you can look up Solar Sunrise or Moonlight Maze. From there, I became a defense contractor working for the Air Intelligence Agency, did a lot with intrusion detection and network architecture. About 2008, I joined Microsoft uh, as part of the MSRC, patched everything from Microsoft Windows to .NET to all points in between. If you've ever heard of Config or Stuxnet, I worked on those cases. And then starting in the end of 2014, I came to the Zero Day Initiative. So what are we protecting against in the ZDI? Uh, one of the things that we like to look for is really impactful stuff. I'm about to play you a video. I'll try and talk over a little bit, so hopefully you can hear uh, what I'm saying as the video occurs because it does have noise. We received an email from uh, a researcher who said, hey, are you interested in Microsoft Exchange? We said, yes, actually we are. And he sent us this. Now this demonstration is showing uh, a local someone who's attached to the Exchange server make some changes to their own inbox and then is going to leave themselves a voicemail. Uh, in doing so, they're going to take over the Exchange server. To access your mailbox, enter your extension. To contact someone, press the pound key. I think it's great that even when hacking your own exchange server, the name of the person you're calling, last name you have first, to go through the robot. Or to spell the part of their email address that comes before the at sign, press the pound key twice. If you know the extension, press the pound key. To speak to an operator, press the Enter the extension of the person you're calling. To cancel, press the star key. Connecting you to attacker one. To leave a message instead, press the pound key. Please leave a message for Attacker 1. After the tone, please record your message. When you finish recording, hang up or press the pound key for more options. Boom. Now on the right side of your screen there, you're seeing the Process Explorer on the Target Exchange server. And that demonstration shows that we're now executing our own code at system level. The attacker is then going to go back to his own exchange inbox uh, and clean up the modifications, making it a little bit harder for you to see uh, in the post that anything has occurred. But that's how a local attacker can take over his uh, own exchange server. So as I said, the Zero Day Initiative is the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. And we will talk about what that means, because I know there's some cute, confusing marketing out there. And what we do is we purchase zero-day reports from independent researchers around the world. What we do with those reports is the first thing we do is we provide filters uh, for our own customers in the form of virt a virtual patch. And then we work with the vendor uh, to resolve the vulnerability that was reported to us. Here's how that looks. We have zero-day exposure that occurs throughout our lifetimes, okay, for a the lifetime of any bug, there's going to be this exposure. 
And there are those who say zero day exploits are incredibly rare and that they're too rare for us to worry about. Well, I don't know about the second part, but they're definitely rare. However, zero day vulnerabilities are incredibly common. Uh, you can find about 350 of them. If you look on our website, we post all of the ones that we submit to vendors when they're waiting for resolution. And it starts with an independent researcher submitting a vulnerability to the ZDI program. Uh, we validate that vulnerability, and uh, if it's, we find it good, we'll make them an offer. Once purchased, we create that virtual patch called the digital vaccine, and we notify the vendor. 120 days later, we publicly disclose it, hopefully after a vendor has released a patch, but that's not always the case. Sometimes a vendor doesn't release the patch. However, we do have that 120 day disclosure timeline that we hold vendors to. In the meantime, we released that virtual patch. Uh, in 2018, it was an average of 61 days ahead of the actual patch being released from the vendor. This provides us pro uh, protections ahead of that vendor patch being available in case that zero day vulnerability does become a zero day exploit, but it also provides some details in case uh, a vendor does not produce a patch or uh, as you'll see, once that patch is available, now we move from zero day exposure to end day exposure, meaning it's been end days since the vendor patch is available. Now zero day exploits are incredibly rare. However, end day exploits are incredibly common. Bugs in software are hard to find unless it's the second Tuesday of every month. Second Tuesday of August, Adobe and Microsoft combined to tell you where 170 bugs are in their products. They did this through security patches. The disclosure that drives action there is just apply the patch and you'll be fine. So hopefully you do apply that patch before active attacks become available. But a lot of times the inverse is actually true. So active attacks occur before you have those patches applied. The great thing is, is that the virtual patch defenses are available throughout the zero day exposure and the end day exposure as you are testing and deploying those patches regardless of when the active attacks may occur. So let's take a look at this and see how it looks in a couple of case studies. And the first one is a really great one because it affected a lot of products. Uh, and it all starts with the vendor shipping a bug, which thank goodness they do because uh, I wouldn't be employed if vendors didn't ship bugs for me. In this case, an independent researcher found a SharePoint bug that affected all versions of SharePoint. We purchased that bug on October 15th of 2018. Now, the nice thing here is when we purchase a bug, you'll see the, the research kind of disappear from the equation. They're free to go do whatever they do, go find more bugs, uh, enjoy the, the fruits of their labor, just relax and have a vacation, whatever it is, because we handle the rest of the notification. In this case, we notified Microsoft on October 16th of the bug. Our virtual patch shipped December 27th, 2018, and Microsoft shipped their patch on February 12th. And that is uh, 67 days after the virtual patch was made available. Now this was a really good bug and it was so good that we worked with the original researcher to blog about it on our, blog, our website because uh, we thought it was very good. And I was literally ready to hit the publish button on that blog when we received a frantic email from the researcher saying, wait, the vendor patch that was released is not sufficient and is easily, uh, it's easily circumvented. So we reported that back to Microsoft and they had to release a second patch on March 12th, 95 days after the virtual patch was deployed. We made sure we took 24 hours to make sure everything was okay. And then we published our blog on March 13th. Unsurprisingly, this bug was so good that it did end up being used in active exploits. The first being seen on April 23rd, a full 137 days after the virtual patch was, reveal was available and 42 days after the second patch was released. So this shows how the process works in the zero day initiative and kind of the value of it. Uh, if you don't believe in zero day exploits, that's fine. But those end day exploits were floating for 42 days after the second patch was available and that virtual patch was in place. Of course, we're not entirely reliant on external researchers. The Zero Day Initiative, part of the reason we founded it was to enhance our own internal research. And this kind of shows what that was. In this case, again, we have a vendor shipping a bug, except it was a Zero Day Initiative researcher, Simon, Simon Zuckerbrod, who found it December, uh, th excuse me, December 31st, 2018. Uh, Simon's a great guy. I don't know why he's spending New Year's Eve looking for IE bugs, but that's exactly what he was doing. 
After the New Year's break, we reported this on January 9th of 2018 to Microsoft and shipped our patch on February 5th, 2019. Microsoft shipped their patch on April 9th. Uh, and that is some time between the, the virtual patch being available and the vendor patch being available. But again, you can say, well, zero day exploits are, are too rare for me to worry about. Well, this one gets a little bit more interesting uh, because Simon just didn't discover a bug. He discovered an entirely new attack uh, class. So of course we blogged about it six weeks approximately after that patch was available because we wanted to make sure people had time to actually deploy that patch. So we, on March 21st, we uh, blogged about it. And as expected, we did detect attacks starting on July 9th, which is 154 days after the virtual patch was deployed. Uh, our colleagues over at the, the Trend Micro Secure Protection Network blogged about this on July 16th. Now this case study shows how, uh, as the largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program, the research we do influences others. Again, it starts with the vendor shipping a bug. And in this case, we had an external researcher find an exchange elevation of privilege bug. You just saw a demonstration of that, affected all versions of exchange, and sold that to us on October 21st, 2018. We reported it to Microsoft uh, about nine days later. And I went back and I had to look, why was there a delay in the notification on this? Turns out we were all at Black Hat and reporting zero days to a vendor from unsecured uh, hotel networks during Black Hat and DEF CON week, generally a bad idea, so we don't do that. Microsoft released their patch for this, or excuse me, we released our patch, virtual patch on October 30th, and then Microsoft released their initial guidance on November 13th. And I say initial guidance here because they didn't release a patch. Their bulletin actually said, apply this registry key uh, to mitigate this entry. Now, this was a really good bug. You saw the demo. Uh, I wanted to blog about it. It actually ended up being one of our top five bugs for the year 2018. And I published this on uh, December 19th. An independent third party uh, pivoted off that research and published a zero day blog on January 21st, referencing our work. Again, this wasn't us that published the zero day blog, it was someone else. This caused uh, Microsoft to release an advisory on February 5th with additional guidance. They made an architectural change to Exchange on February 12th, and then produced a second bulletin on February 12th as well. So it is unlikely these uh, additional mitigations and uh, protections would have been made public had it not been for the research published by the ZDI that pivoted, that, that allowed someone else to pivot off of that and publish their research. And finally, as much as I would like to say that all uh, research originates with the Zero Day Initiative, it doesn't, but we do have industry partners that we work with. Hopefully you recognize the CVE 0708, uh, that's better known as Blue Keep. In this case, Microsoft shipped a bug and it was found by the UK's NCSC, the National Cyber Security Center. They reported it to Microsoft at some time and uh, they released the patch on May 14th, 2019. We worked with them to create our virtual patches through our MAP partnership uh, as soon as we could after that patch release. We also worked with our research team to analyze and fully publish the details of this bug on May 28th. That blog is now referenced greatly when talking about Blue Keep. And of course, active attacks will be seen on I don't know when. Uh, I can say you having to, speaking to some of the colleagues I have at Microsoft, they don't expect this to really hit in the wild despite uh, uh, some guidance otherwise. But in the most recent uh, Patch Tuesday, we had four other RDP bugs that are very similar. I think they're calling it Deja Blue now, which kudos to that name, it's puntacular. Uh, and we, I, there have already been several uh, proof of concepts for that. So it is very likely we will see some RDP attacks in our near future. So it kind of shows you some case studies over how it works overall. And to the extent it works, looking back at 2018, it was our busiest year in ZDI history. We published 1,450 advisories on our webpage across multiple vendors. Being vendor agnostic means that we buy bugs in Microsoft, Adobe, Apple, Cisco, HPE, Google, uh, you name it, lots of SCADA stuff. Uh, if it's something applicable to our customers, there's a pretty good chance we're buying it. We purchased uh, over 1,150 vulnerabilities. And why is there a delta between these two numbers? Well, again, our own ZDI researchers are finding zero days through their own work 
and we're publishing those. We reported almost 1,300 bugs to uh, the various vendors in 2018. And there's a delta between the time a bug is reported and the time it's published, so that's why you see a difference in those numbers. Generally speaking, it was a 40% year-over-year increase. And as you can see, we've done 40% year-over-year increases two years in a row. Most of everything that we do is through coordinated disclosure. Uh, we started back in 2005 with one published advisory. We're now up to 1450. I can tell you in 2019, we're keeping pace with last year. I, we certainly will not exceed it by 40%, but we should be around that number as well. So we're continuing to stay busy. Of the 1,450 published advisories we had, only 158 were zero-day disclosures, meaning that they had uh, they were either looked at by the vendor and said, we're not fixing this, in which case we go ahead and publish our information, or it had uh, gone past their 120-day disclosure deadline, and we went ahead and published that information. That disclosure deadline is there to, to help keep vendors on their toes and to make sure that they're not sweeping bugs under the rug and ignoring our reports. Over the history of the program, we've had over 5,500 advisories, and we've awarded more than $20 million to various independent researchers around the world. Which comes to our first poll question. I'd really like to hear your time, because 120 days is what we use, but what do you believe to be the appropriate amount at a time uh, to allow a vendor to develop a security patch? Uh, some organizations say 90 days, some say 120, some say 180, some say 90 if it's under active attack, so I'd love to get your opinion. I'll be honest with you, I don't think there is a right answer for this, but I can tell you, based on our uh, experience, 120 days seems to be a very good option that serves both the research community as well as our vendors. Give me just a second to make your answer there, and we'll look at the results. Okay, wow, a lot of you think uh, 60 days would be the appropriate amount of time, so that's interesting. Okay, I'll take that uh, information back and let folks know that we should ramp up our schedules. So one big thing that I do wanna talk about uh, with you today is threat intelligence, because there are a lot of companies and a lot of organizations that say they do threat intelligence, but they're very nebulous as to what that exactly means. So I wanna break it down, and when I say ZDI does threat intelligence and we work with threat intelligence, what am I saying with that? And it starts with that virtual patch. There are many organizations that will develop a virtual patch or an IDS signature or an IPS signature. Really, it comes down to these four areas, right? You've got to do R&D, you've got to QA it, you do an internal release, and you do a global release. Well, it's in this research and development that we get this nebulous thing called threat intelligence. And for most companies, 70% of that is through third-party services. 10% is through internal research and 20% is industry partnerships. So let's look at what that actually means. When it comes to sources of threat intelligence, from our perspective, there are four areas that you get this threat intel. You buy bug reports, you acquire knowledge through purchasing intellectual property. You discover things through independent research or by detecting attacks in the wild. You have those industry partnerships, which are crucial. We like to say uh, our only competition is the bad guys. We work together throughout the industry. And then you, the, the fourth is patch analysis. You acquire knowledge through reversing security patches released by vendors. So let's start with purchasing bug reports. And with the ZDI, we are the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. Like I said, more than 20 million awarded throughout the lifetime of the program. It'll be 15 years of the program next year. And planning a party, you're all invited. Um, and of course, we have Pwn to Own as well. This is the world's most prestigious hacking competition. We have one in the spring in Vancouver, and then one in the fall in Tokyo. The spring version uh, looks at enterprise products. The fall version is more focused on consumer products and uh, mobile handsets. Uh, over the years, we've looked at uh, Google Home, Amazon Echo. We awarded a Tesla Model 3 this spring. So we purchase a lot of bug reports. That gives us a great insight into threat intelligence. I also said we discover our own stuff too. Uh, each CDI researcher, and there are about a dozen of them, are tasked with finding their own ODAs. Uh, 20 ODAs a year is what they're tasked with finding, and they always make that. We present our findings around the world at various conferences, and of course we publish them on our ZDI blog, 
I published a blog this morning about a, a vulnerability buffer overflow in the Squid Proxy. It's now patched. But definitely, if you use Squid Proxy or if you're interested in that type of research, take a look at that. It's amazing that after all these years, we still see heat buffer overflows. Oh, also, a uh, neat thing today, I learned that Squid still supports Gopher. Cute. But of course, we're also looking for active attacks. So we have our smart protection network, that SPN, that provides a, a view of all of our Trend Micro component fees, feeds. Uh, again, it was used to attack, uh, that find that active attack in the wild that I talked about earlier. Uh, and it provides uh, attribution to uh, known and unknown CVEs. We have found multiple ODAs being actively exploited with this. Uh, and really, for SPN, I can tell you, this is just really ramping up. And we're just kind of scratching the surface with it. So I'm excited for the next year of what we see out of SPN. Industry partnerships, of course. Uh, I, I mentioned this because we are not alone. Microsoft, we are MAP partners with, as well as Adobe. They provide us information about developing virtual patches ahead of release. Uh, I mentioned Tesla. We uh, awarded a Model 3 at this year's Pwn to Own. But we also work with VMware uh, and Facebook. We've got partnerships coming up with them. We've worked with Apple extensively. Uh, this isn't unique to us, but it just shows that we are really participating, especially when it comes to Microsoft. They're longtime co-sponsors of Pwn to Own. Uh, and Pwn to Own Tokyo, I should mention, we should be announcing something in the next week or two for this year's uh, event. We've got some uh, wonderful new targets coming up, but I can't wait to talk about it publicly. Of course, that fourth area was patch analysis. And Trend Micro's vulnerability research service was formerly known as TELUS Labs out of Canada. They're the world's foremost agency for reversing patches. They do it several hundred times a year and have a feed that anyone that folks can pay to subscribe to. It's great. They uh, really look at uh, in depth the patches that are released by multiple vendors. They create a proof concept code and give, provide detection to guidance. So it's a lot of information that not only are we getting as Trend Micro, but then others are in the, throughout the industry are subscribing to. So when I look at virtual patching at Trend Micro, this is the way it normally stacks up at everyone else. But at Trend, we take those numbers and kind of flip them a little bit. So for us, 70% of our threat intelligence come from internal research and only 10% from third-party services. And again, about 20% from our industry partnerships. So even though we do it like everyone else, I prefer to be the originator of the threat intelligence rather than the regurgitator of the threat intelligence. And with that, let's go ahead and talk about Pwn to Own because it's a lot of fun. Uh, Pwn to Own actually started in Vancouver in 2007. If you can go back in a time machine and watch TV at the time, you would have seen a lot of ads that said, I'm a Mac and I'm a PC. Max at the time had a much more stellar reputation for security and the conference organizer of uh, CanSec West in Vancouver didn't think that was entirely deserved. So he had a MacBook and he said, I'm going to place this MacBook on this network here at this conference. And if anyone can pwn it, uh, you can own it. And then he turned to the ZDI representatives and said, by the way, would you like to purchase the bug? And we said, yes, we would. We'll give you $10,000 for whatever you use. And that was the genesis of Pwn to Own. And from that, it has grown, and we have awarded over $15 million just in this contest over the years. We had our 10-year anniversary. It has grown from simple MacBooks to encompass browsers, uh, operating systems, desktop applications such as Office, Word, uh, as well as virtual machines. That's been the greatest uh, to me over the last few years, seeing things like VMware as well as uh, VirtualBox and Hyper-V get attacked. This year's contest, we gave away uh, quite a bit of money on these five categories. We had a Tesla Model 3 with six categories and over $300,000 available. Microsoft RDP, we were really hoping to kind of get Blue Keep before it came out, uh, but unfortunately we didn't. Enterprise apps, browsers, and of course the virtual machines like I mentioned. We awarded over $545,000 for 19 bugs. And one thing I want to mention about Pwn to Own, when you submit a bug to our regular program, you don't need a full working exploit. You just need enough to demonstrate that it's a real bug. It will go ahead and purchase that from you. However, at Pwn to Own, you need a full working exploit chain. So that's one of the reasons why the awards are so much higher. Our master of Pwn there is a team of Richard Zhu on the left and Amant on the right. They won $375,000 themselves, as well as a Tesla Model 3. Richard picked that up. I don't know how you worked that out with uh, Amant that he got the car and 
not a mod, but in, in any case, Master of Pwn is something that we came about with a, a few years ago. Because if you have multiple contestants that register for the same category, let's say Apple Safari, the order that they go in is a random drawing. Put their names in a, in a, a literal hat and draw it. Uh, only the first person who actually does it gets the full cash award. So if you have a bad drawing, even if you have better research, you could end up with a, cash, a lower cash award. What we wanted to do is balance that out with uh, the researchers to show who was the overall winner. So we started awarding points for each successful attempt, and we call the person with the most points the master of poem. This really created a few interesting things for us. Uh, for one, it showed like if you're the fourth round in this, you could still have the best research and get the full award of points because the points don't go down round after round, only if the cash award goes down. It also calls certain teams to do defensive submissions. To be a successful pwned own winner, you has to be a true zero day, meaning we have no knowledge of it and the vendor has no knowledge of it. So when you do a successful demonstration, we go up to a disclosure room and the contestants tell us the details of what's going on. We make sure that we've never heard of it and confirm it. We bring in the affected vendor. They make sure that they've never heard of it and confirm it. What we had happen in 2017 and 2018, <coughs> excuse me, is that we had, uh, people who were submitting bugs against other teams. So we'd have a successful demonstration. We'd bring in the vendor and the vendor goes, actually, we had that submitted to us last week by your competitor. So it was great to see people actually trying to take out other people's bugs uh, in the end. It's, it's really great for us because we get some amazing research. Uh, let's take a look at what it took to hack a Tesla with one of our own researchers. Hey, I'm uh, Jaisal Spellman with the Zero Day Initiative, and I'm going to demonstrate a exploit against the infotainment unit of a Tesla Model 3. First, you connect to a wireless access point, and in this case, because it requires internet access or it will automatically disconnect from a wireless access point, I have this laptop acting uh, as kind of a pass-through, but also poisoning DNS so that I can capture and uh, basically just host the exploit. So I have this laptop here listening for requests from when the exploit finishes. So what we're gonna do is open up the browser and go to the domain I'm hosting the exploit on, which is just my.exploit. And now the exploit is going to be triggered. At this point, it's gonna trigger a old JIT vulnerability, get code execution, and then continue on to uh, send data back to my laptop before redirecting for an image. Yep, there we go. That was great. One of the interesting things about Pwn to Own and one of the terrifying things is uh, we never have an idea of who's going to show up and actually participate uh, until they actually get there. So rather than have uh, a Tesla in front of the uh, hotel waiting for someone to show up, we made sure that one of our internal researchers actually had an exploit. So we tasked Jaisal to find a bug, and sure enough, he did. Our industry partnerships also allowed uh, Tesla to work with us uh, um, in um, don't infotainment don't units. Don't do, do. Okay, there we go. They shipped infotainment units to us as well as to certain uh, select researchers around the world. Also wanted to say that uh, the infotainment units run at 110 and 220. And we actually did have a couple of researchers fry power supplies because they were uh, not switching them over. But it was great to see that awarded. Pondo in Tokyo is, like I said, is coming up here in the next couple of weeks as far as the announcement for what's going on in 2019. Last year, we awarded $325,000 for 18 zero days. If that pair looks familiar, it's because it was the same master of Pond, Richard Zhu and Amat Kama. They are definitely a dream team. In those two events, they won over half a million dollars and a car, and several laptops, a couple of big trophies, some cool jackets. Multiple handsets were exploited, the iPhone, the Galaxy, the Xiaomi Mi6. Uh, and some really fantastic research was discovered there in Tokyo. This year, we're expanding it even farther with uh, additional consumer devices. We'll have additional handsets there. Uh, I can't give you details yet, but 
boy, am I looking forward to it. It's going to be fantastic. Um, I also wanted to just really quickly give you a, a little update. Uh, it appears that uh, the PDF slides are not available. So you will get an email with a link to download the PDF slides and on-demand recording later. Sorry about that. It looks like there was an error when we uploaded the slides, but they will be available. Over the years of Pwn to Own, it's really driven a lot of changes. We've got stronger sandboxes now. I'll tell you a quick little story. Uh, one year, we did not include Mozilla Firefox. I think it was 2015, uh, because we felt that their sandbox wasn't uh, sufficient to really be tested. And we had said that in our public statements. The Mozilla CEO just responded on Twitter with the word, ouch. One of my favorite tweets of all time. I just had to throw that out there. Uh, good news is Firefox is back in. Uh, but we've also seen some other vulnerability-specific mitigations like isolated heap, MinGC, and reduced attack surface such as Win32 module isolation, all of this in the effort to stop that calc from popping. Um, and this isn't just my uh, view. Uh, I'll show you a little quick clip here from Dave Weston, who works at Microsoft. He's part of their uh, defensive team, mainly in the browser space, but I'll let him uh, talk about how Microsoft views Pono. What was our inspiration for this? So we had a lot of luck and a lot of um, it got a lot of value off of the, the Pwn to Own competition. So every year, for those of you who don't know, there's sort of a, a grand championship of hacking, at least in the browser space, called Pwn to Own. Uh, and folks from around the world come and exploit browsers. And as I said, that's really a technical feat at this point because we've reduced the number of people who can actually bypass mit uh, world, you know, mitigations in modern platforms to a very small percentage. And so every year, we would kind of hang out and wait for these exploits to come in, and we'd tear them apart the second they came in, and we'd make all kinds of improvements. So this list here is just a few places where either we were inspired based on analysis of a pwn to exploit, or we were further kind of uh, evangelized, or we, we, we were able to work with management to say, see, what we were saying is true. We're seeing these kind of techniques used in the wild. We were able to land a whole bunch of improvements. So that's great. It's great to see uh, others recognize that. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story just about the, the vendors at Pwned Own, too. It occurs at the, the Westin in Vancouver. And uh, it, it's great. Uh, my boss, is boss, my senior VP, was there for the first time. And he was just astonished that you'd have Apple and uh, Microsoft and Adobe just sitting in the hallway waiting for us to call them in. Uh, and he thought that was the biggest thing. Uh, but anyway, just fun. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, and we get some really amazing research. It also allows us to guide researchers towards specific targets. For example, our first virtual machine category was introduced in 2016, but we didn't have any entries until 2017. We had two virtual machine escapes. Now VMware submissions are more common and we're seeing that sort of research being done. And that's one way that we can use Pwn to Own that I think is overlooked quite a bit, is we can guide researchers into areas of topics of research where we want to see either our customers are impacted by the bugs, in those areas, specifically virtual machine bugs, or it's just areas where we really want to see what's going on. One area that we're pushing folks towards now is container research. Uh, containers were really designed for convenience, not necessarily security. So I think that there's a lot of bugs to be found in that region that really would be incredibly impactful for a lot of things. So that said, let's move on and contrast the different types of bug bounty programs, because I think there's a lot of confusion. Bug bounties used to be incredibly controversial. Now they're so commonplace, I think folks get, they don't even realize that there are different types available. And really what it comes down to is there are four different types of bug bounty programs. You have vendor specific programs, vendor agnostic programs, which is where we are, uh, a category that I call bug bounty as a service, and this is where most of the confusion comes in, and then we get into the gray market, which is the exploit brokers and government sales. And we'll start with the vendor specific programs, because quite frankly, if you're a vendor with more than 5,000 employees, there's a pretty good chance you've got a bug bounty program going on these days. This is just a small sampling of the vendor programs that are available. And I put Mozilla first because Mozilla is credited as having the first modern bug bounty program, vendor specific one, starting in 2004. Uh, Later, Microsoft, after saying they would never have a bug bounty program, sort of had one, now they really have one. Apple had an invite, only one for a long time. They just announced they're changing that, although we'll see how that goes. Uh, Tesla has theirs, and of course, they've worked with us on Pwn to Own. 
United has their po uh, bug bounty program. They reward you in frequent flyer miles. The really good uh, exploits get uh, a million miles. So those are out there, and these are great. Because if you are HP, let's say, it's a lot cheaper to buy a bug in HP than to respond to a publicly used exploit in your products. So it makes sense for these folks to run vendor-specific programs. Now, the downside to this is if you sell a bug as a researcher to a particular company, and I won't call anyone out, uh, I'll just make up you know, Bob's House of Widgets, they could decide not to act on that bug. But once you've sold them that intellectual property, they can say that, well, we don't want you to disclose it publicly, even though we've uh, not, even though we're not going to act on it. That has happened, and actually has happened as recently as of yesterday, uh, with a particular uh, bug bounty program in a particular piece of gaming software, which I will go uh, unnamed, uh, where they said we're not fixing this bug, but we don't you to pu don't want you to publicly disclose it. So on the one hand, vendor-specific programs do make sense for the vendors, but they don't always make sense for the researcher. That's where vendor agnostic programs come in. There are essentially three that uh, still exist. There have been more over the years. We're the largest, founded in 2005. I wish I could say we're the oldest, but iDefense beats us by a couple of years. They focus more on threat intelligence than vulnerability acquisition. Those are their words, not mine. Um, so they're buying much fewer bugs than we are. There's also the Beyond Security uh, Secure Team Disclosure Program, founded in 2007. They're not completely vendor agnostic, but they do buy bugs in multiple different types of products. And then here's where the confusion comes in. And this is where the bug bounty is a service. This is the bug crowd and the hacker one, or hacker I think is how you actually pronounce that. Uh, and these were founded near the same times, and they were designed to let companies who want to have a bug bounty program but not run a bug bounty program have that. Uh, and they talk about all of the money that they spend on bugs. Well, really, it's the, the back end customers who are spending that money and they're taking 25% off the top. They're great programs, so it could be wrong, uh, but I don't care about cross site scripting bugs in Starbucks website. Uh, that's not really impacting my customers. It's not a thing that I, as ZDI, am looking at, but I'm glad Starbucks cares. And I'm glad that they're working with Hackeroni to get their, to have their bug bounty program run. Synac is also kind of crowdsourced as well. Um, they were founded a couple of years later. Uh, it's very interesting to watch the development of these bug bounty as a service programs. One thing about a bug bounty is when you start a bug bounty in a product or a platform, you'll see an initial spike of bug reports, right? Which makes sense. Turns out cash is a big motivator for researchers finding bugs in your products. But if you're doing it right, over time, that, that'll that drop off. So you get this hockey stick increase, but then it falls off over time. Uh, if you're Bug Crowd or Hacker One or Synac and your entire business model is taking place around charging other people for buying bugs, the, the decline in purchasing bugs is not good for you. So that's why you see these folks now branching out into crowdsource penetration testing and other things. But it's still great that they exist. Uh, if you want to get into running a bug bounty program, it's probably easier to contract these, to run it, than to set one up on your own. As someone who set one up on its own, believe me, it's a lot easier to have everyone else do the work. And finally, there are exploit brokers. And I put the big three up here, uh, Exodus, Zerodium, and CrowdFence. Uh, Zerodium is probably the biggest and largest one known. Uh, and these are folks who are not just buying bugs, but they are selling bugs. They're not just buying bug reports, but they're buying full exploits, and they're developing full exploits, and then reselling them. Well, reselling them to whom? That's a very good question, because they won't tell you. And then who will pay for it afterwards, and what do they use it for? Well, Zerodium publicly offers more than a million dollars. I think they're up to a million and a half for a full iPhone jailbreak. Now, if they're buying it for a million and a half dollars, they must be selling it at a profit, who has that type of money? Well, that's going to be governments. They're not the only ones doing this, of course. Uh, Kevin Mitnick has his absolute zero day exploit exchange. I'm not poking fun at that. That's his actual logo. And then I bring up Kubricon, even though they're out of business now. They did recently speak at Black Hat about uh, broker sales. But really, the person behind this or the entity behind this is the, the governments. And if there's a government with an intelligence apparatus, they're participating in this marketplace or they're attempting to participate in this marketplace. 
So I put this shadowy figure in here because obviously if I'm spending, if I'm buying bugs for a million dollars, I'm selling it to an agency that can literally print money. So why do folks go with ZDI rather than uh, any of these other options? Uh, that's a good, great question. And one of the, the biggest answers is the maturity of the program. We've been around for a while. We have a very good reputation and a long track record with both researchers and security vendors. Uh, when we send a report to a vendor, especially if they have a mature response process, like the Apples, the Adobe's, the Microsoft's, they know what they're going to get. Uh, and uh, they, they understand what's coming on. We're also a single source for multiple vendors. Uh, we have a rewards program similar to a frequent flyer program. So as, the more you submit, the more points you gain at our top level, which is 65,000 points, you get a one-time cash award of $25,000 US, plus then 25% bonus on any other bug we buy. So let's say we buy a bug, uh, you have platinum status with us, and we contract a bug for $1,000 that instantly becomes 1250. I use round numbers because I'm not good at math. Uh, there's also the anonymity from the vendor. Uh, some researchers don't want to be known to the vendor or from the public at large, and, and we're fine with that. Uh, we've had researchers who maybe their employer doesn't entirely smile upon them selling bugs to others, or they just don't want to be known, or they're in a unique principality where it might be best to stay anonymous, and we're absolutely fine with that. We keep them anonymous from the vendors, and as long as we have enough information to essentially know where to send the check, uh, we're good to go. And then, of course, we have vendor accountability. As I mentioned, uh, vendors who are purchasing their own bugs are free to do whatever they want to with them. Uh, however, when you sell a bug to us, a vendor is not at liberty to completely ignore the report without consequences. Now, they may, be, they may say to themselves, well, I'll, I'll deal with the consequences, uh, but um, there are consequences. I also wanted to address something else because it just happened yesterday and because it was kind of a unique scenario. And, it, and it, I've had questions from researchers about this in the past. The question is, well, what happens if I offer you my bug report and you bid on it and then I turn you down? What happens then? And that's a great question because that's essentially what happened with that uh, gaming software. They, they submitted a report. They said, we're not fixing it. Said, we want to go public with it. Said, no, you can't do that. It's really simple. If we do not contract a report at the ZDI, we do not act on it, period. Uh, and then you are free to do whatever you want to with it. So let me run through a scenario. You provide us a bug report. We say, hey, we're not interested in this. Thanks, but no thanks. And you say, well, I'm going public with it. We'll say, well, we prefer coordinated vulnerability disclosure, but you do you. And that's, that's pretty much the end of it. Or we offer and you say, hey, that's not enough for me. I'm going to take it elsewhere. We say, great, good luck. Uh, our offer is valid for seven days in case you change your mind. And then they are free to go off and do whatever with it, and we take no actions on it whatsoever. So that's one thing that I want to be very clear is unless we contract a, a bug report, then we don't action on it. But then once we contract that bug report, essentially we're buying intellectual property, and then we are available to, to act on it. Now, we do have a clause in our vendor disclosure that says uh, researchers must ask for permission after a bug is patched to go talk about it. We've never said no throughout the lifetime of our program, and researchers have talked about the bugs they've submitted to ZDI throughout the world at various conferences, even to the point where we've had people who've gone to Pwn to Own and lost, and then they go talk about it publicly, which is fine from our perspective as well. I mentioned uh, looking at guiding research. One of the biggest areas where we're trying to guide research right now is through our targeted incentive program, and these are the largest publicly available white market prices that you will see on any of this stuff, uh, with the exception of maybe Hyper-V. Well, no, Hyper-V is not on our list anymore, right? Uh, these are the ones where we want the really big targets. It, consider it kind of a pwn to own, because the first person to claim ISC bind will get $200,000, and then that falls off our list and something new will come on. We really want to shape research and point researchers into these areas. And for certain things, we're offering up to a quarter of a million dollars uh, publicly to do that. Um, we're hoping to get some really good bugs in Exchange, Outlook. Those are really impactful. If you saw the news today, uh, they just busted up a big Nigerian-based uh, business email compromise ring. Uh, they talked about over $3 billion a year being lost to business email compromise. So we're really looking for things like that. 
I haven't seen a great Apache bug in a while, and I would love to spend $200,000 to get one. Same thing for Nginx. That's uh, incredibly popular right now, and I want to see where that goes. So with that, let's talk more about money. Uh, we've talked about the various things that a researcher can do. Let's talk about where the money goes. So a researcher will find a bug, and they sell it to a bug bounty program who then reports it to the vendor. This is anywhere between a few hundred dollars to up to about $25,000 for most bug reports. Of course, we release our virtual patches, and the vendor eventually will release their patch. But that's not the only option. Researchers can also sell on the black market to an exploit writer for generally up to $250,000. They can sell it directly to a government for a million plus, or that vulnerability broker for one and a half million plus. Now the government and vuln broker down here, this is what I refer to as the gray market, because then those exploits get used against question mark. Now in my altruistic mind, in my optimistic mind, I'm thinking, well, governments are using these uh, bugs to make sure that they're getting the right targets and they're disrupting terrorist oper operations or they're disrupting other bad guys. And then my pessimistic side goes, well, governments are using this to oppress their own people. But really when we're talking about this gray market, we can't unlink the vulnerability brokers and the governments uh, because there's such big money involved. It's very rare that you'll see a private organization buy these exploits. But still the question becomes, who is that used against? Some researchers can't live with themselves to, under, to, to not know where their research is going or how it's being used. Some researchers can, and uh, I'm not gonna pass judgment on that because I've got three kids about to go to college and uh, those numbers look nice to me as well. One other thing I wanna know about talking, selling to the gray market is once you've sold to these entities, you could never talk about your research again. So there's no one out there at Black Hat, DEF CON, Offensive CON, wherever, talking about the bugs they've sold to vuln brokers or governments uh, governments tend to frown on that action. Uh, essentially, once you sell it, it's dead to you and you never get to take credit for it. So that's another reason you stay in the white market is because you want to invest in yourself and talk about your research afterwards. Now, of course, if I'm selling into an exploit writer uh, and I'm an exploit writer buying it for a quarter million dollars, I've got to make my money back as well. So I'm going to sell that exploit on to a botnet creator who's going to compromise a bunch of PCs. I have to make my money back. So I'm going to rent that to a bot herder who's going to do essential, the usual suspects, credential harvesting, DDoS extortion, although we're seeing less and less of that. Spamming, as I mentioned, uh, spammers are a big thing still, and of course, ransomware. That credential harvester is selling stolen creds from anywhere from uh, 5 to $50. I, I now heard that the prices actually might be increasing for chip cards with PIN is over $100 each. So that smart criminal is going to buy them and make one big purchase, and then they're actually going to resell that cred to a dumb criminal who's going to buy beer and chips. Now, this area is completely legal with an asterisk. Because there's this thing called the Wassenaar Arrangement, which was introduced a few years ago uh, to prevent the spread of what they call uh, cyber arms uh, or cyber weapons, and the, the highlighted countries in green are those who participate in this. So depending on where you're at, there is additional paperwork that you have to fill out before you are able to sell uh, bugs or, in, in our case, purchase bugs. We've had to you know, write down that we are receiving cyber arms from this individual. Uh, there's a lot of information posted online about this. Uh, and if you report things to us, we are happy to help you fill out that paperwork. The gray market is mostly legal. And I say mostly because, for example, if I were to sell to my government, they would not have issues with that, but if I were to sell to a different government, they would probably frown on that very much. There are, are also some uh, municipalities, principalities, where buying bugs is not necessarily illegal, but I know in certain countries, uh, all O-days must also be reported to the government, uh, so that's why I have that asterisk there. And of course, getting to the black market, this is definitely not legal, but yes, there's still an asterisk here. Why? is because there's some principalities and municipalities that don't have laws on the books explicitly preventing ransomware, for example, because ransomware is more recent than the laws. So they're trying to take laws that exist and apply it to known bad behavior. Now, this guy typically gets caught. This person here, the dumb person using restolen, resold stolen creds to buy beer and chips, they're almost always caught. Uh, thanks to PCI compliance, pen and chip, and a few other technologies, 
credit card fraud is getting a lot better. Spammers usually get caught, as you saw in today's news, uh, because if nothing else, everyone hates spammers. So they, they tend to get caught. Smart criminals who are uh, buying that one credential harvested uh, cred, they're starting to get caught more and more often now too. Uh, again, the co credit card companies are being very good. I'll tell you a quick story about this. We had a 13 year old who's a sneaker head and he's really into like tennis, expensive tennis shoes. Uh, there's a special edition of Yeezys that were coming out and I was gonna use my card, he's gonna pay me back with his money. Chase immediately flagged that uh, as uh, an invalid tra transaction. Because let's face it, I do not. Dustin Childs does not buy Yeezys. Uh, however, I had to go. No, no, no. That was really me. I really meant to do that. So they're getting much better at that. These folks, however, rarely get caught, and when they do get caught, it makes big news, especially when it comes to the ransomware stuff uh, or the botnet creator. Uh, little known fact: If you uh, remember, in 2008-2009, as Config was wrapping up, Microsoft released a bounty for a half million dollars for information re leading to the conviction, the arrest and conviction of whoever created the conficker, worm, that uh, bounty has never been claimed. So hopefully one day uh, someone will step up and go, hey, I, I know that person. Uh, and But that's incredibly unlikely. With that, let's kind of wrap things up. Uh, so again, the ZDI is the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. I think I've uh, been thorough in explaining what vendor agnostic means and why we're different. And we tend to be growing every year. Uh, if you look at our website, which is zerodayinitiative.com, just look at our published advisories and you'll see how many uh, are there as well as the upcoming advisories. Last I checked, which was yesterday, I think there were 352 upcoming advisories that are yet to be disclosed. Bug bounties do impact everyone. Uh, so in addition, so you just watch this and go, well, I don't buy bugs, I don't sell bugs, I don't really care about this too much. But it really does impact everyone throughout the, the ecosystem. Security patches are the most common one. Uh, in 2018, we provided Microsoft more vulnerability reports than any other entity. Same for Adobe, uh, same for ICS cert, which handles all SCADA bugs. Uh, we've submitted a lot of Apple bugs. So you're getting security patches that are the result of bug bounty programs. And I mentioned we try to guide that research too. So it does impact folks, even if you don't participate in that exploit economy. The exploit marketplace is crowded and ever shifting. Uh, if you were at Black Hat a couple of weeks ago, I was, the, the, the booth area there was enormous. And there were a lot of people there who were looking to buy bugs, including companies I'd never seen before that were actively trying to buy bugs. Uh, Tencent, which is a Chinese company, they were actively there trying to go promote their bug bounty program. Of course, Bug Crowd and Hacker One were there. Uh, I was there, a uh, bunch of other folks were there, a uh, bunch of gray market folks were there. I haven't mentioned um, a bunch of people who look very curious for people buying bugs. Well, let's just say they're very fit in shape and have very close hair crops, uh, very close you know, haircuts, who knows? And then finally, remember that zero day vulnerabilities become in day exploits. The biggest example of this is WannaCry from 2017. Microsoft released a patch on Patch Tuesday. Three weeks later, the, that bug was used in WannaCry. There's a delta between patch release, and patch application, and exploit writers, primarily malware and ransomware writers, are looking to exploit that delta. <coughs> Excuse me. And I know a bit about uh, patch management. I know it's difficult, so I understand that there is that delta. And that's where that virtual bit patch becomes so invaluable. Not necessarily just before a patch is released for the zero day protection, but even after the patch becomes available, we have the end day protection as you're testing and applying patches. Because let's face it, there's probably everyone on this call who's been hit by a bad patch at some point. Please plug in with us. Uh, like I said, I blog a lot. And the great thing about uh, our blog at the ZDI.com blog is uh, there's no marketing. It's all technical. It's all uh, just information. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you find a bug, I'd love to purchase it from you. Here's our PTP fingerprints. Please encrypt your bug submissions. We have had to turn down legitimate bug submissions because they were sent in clear text email. Once you send it in clear text email, I can no longer guarantee that it's a zero day. So please encrypt your stuff. And then finally, uh, I thank you for your time and I hope we have some questions. Uh, and if not, if we don't get to all of them, I know we're nearing the top of the hour. 
uh, I will definitely take the time to answer them through email. And uh, let's see what questions we may have. Oh, uh, here's a great question is, uh, do you purchase, do you only purchase bugs that can be filtered by the tipping point appliance? Most of our pre-release bugs go to the tipping point intrusion prevention system. That's very true. But we do look at bugs that go beyond that. For example, uh, it's very hard on the network to detect local privilege escalation bugs. That doesn't mean that we ignore LPEs or elevation of privilege bugs. We are certainly very interested in those. Uh, we certainly do uh, pur purchase them and uh, kind of depends on uh, what we're looking for at that given time. If you ever have any questions, you can send us an email and say, hey, are you interested in purchasing bugs in X or Y? And we'll be happy to answer that for you. Uh, and better to ask that question and let us know rather than spending a lot of time on research and something that we might not want to purchase. Uh, another question I have here is, uh, how do you decide which bugs to purchase? That's a great question too. And the things that we're looking for the most obviously is what's going to impact Trend Micro customers. And it, we're, we're buying bugs to enhance our internal research and we're buying bugs to enhance our products. So what are bugs that are going to protect our, our customers the most? So we're looking for widely deployed things. We're looking for remote code execution. We're looking for things we can filter. We're looking for a bunch of different type of things, but we're looking at what has the most broad impact, I think, is, <clears throat> is the bugs that we're looking for, really. Okay. Oh, here's another good one. Uh, how do I make sure I get the most out of my bug submission? And that's, that's a very good question. In, I'll tell you this, that the same bug can have different values. For example, if you submit a bug report to us and it's just a basic description and it crashed up, it can get 500. Domination doesn't matter for this. Let's just say 500. But let's say you put a little, a little bit more effort into it and have a much better write-up. Maybe there's a proof of concept. Well, that's 1,000 now. Uh, well, let's say you take that same bug, but you write a full white paper and you have a full working exploit. Well, now, now that's 2,000. And the, 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 you know, the, the actual numbers may vary depending on the bug or whatever, but you can, the more work you put into a bug as far as the submission goes, the more cash you will get out of it in the long run. And uh, I can tell you that the, the submissions that we send off to the vendors will have that sort of information already. So it's a matter of who's doing the work, the ZDI analyst or the, the independent researcher submitting it. Uh, so the work is getting done. It's just a matter of who's looking at it. And with that, I think that takes us to the top of the hour. Uh, so again, I thank you for your time and attention. And if I didn't get to any questions or if any questions come in at the last minute, uh, we'll go ahead and include those in the email. Again, apologies on the uh, slides not being immediately available on that widget. We will send the, out a link in that email when we send out a link to the overview. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please hit me up. Also, at Dustin underscore Childs on Twitter, if you want to follow me there. I'll be happy to, happy to answer uh, questions that you may have that you think of later. So with that, I'll say thank you and I uh, hope to see you at a future webcast.